Hey there, did you know you can follow this podcast behind the scenes on Instagram? Just go to Instagram.com slash Lesbian Romantic. Welcome to the Lesbian Romantic Podcast. This is The Diva Story, Part 2. That was the very last one. Finally, Millie thought. She placed the empty moving box in her tiny hallway. She would take it downstairs to the dumpster later. There hadn't been that much stuff to move. But unpacking had taken a lot longer than Millie had expected. She glanced around the small living room. Her apartment still didn't look like a place she'd want to spend a lot of time in. But then again, she probably wouldn't. Millie would be home to sleep, mostly. And she didn't need a bigger place to do just that. Millie also didn't like to complain. Not even to herself. Her parents were hardworking people and supported her any way they could. The sacrifices they were making to support Millie's career were big. And Millie didn't want to seem ungrateful. You're here. And that's the most important thing. She told herself. Millie clapped her hands together, a way of making herself focus on the task at hand, and walked to her even tinier bedroom. It was time to change into her sports gear. Today was Monday, which meant her workout schedule demanded a long run. Millie would walk to Central Park and run there for about an hour. She was looking forward to resting on a bench, enjoying the sunshine for a few minutes afterwards. Millie grabbed a light yellow t-shirt and a blue pair of shorts. She suddenly remembered to check if her Fitbit still had enough battery left to track her workout. Luckily, it did. Once Millie had changed, she walked into her small open kitchen to grab a bottle of water. Now that she was here, she also inspected the contents of her fridge. It was almost empty. She would have to go grocery shopping later. Millie groaned. She had a lot of studying left to do tonight. Going shopping made her to-do list for the evening even longer. Takeout dinner also wasn't an option. She didn't have the money. And getting a cheap pasta after a healthy run seemed counterproductive. Better hurry then, she thought. She closed the fridge and headed for the closet next to her front door. While she was tying up her shoes... She silently wished none of her neighbors would be in the hallway when she left her apartment. They usually wanted to have a chat, and Millie had little time or patience for small talk. All she wanted from her neighbors was for them to be quiet and leave Millie to herself. The last thing she wanted was a So, what do you do for a living? conversation. People usually gaped at her when she answered their question truthfully. One neighbor had actually said, But you're not fat. Aren't you supposed to be huge? Millie shook her head every time she thought of that guy's response. Thank God he didn't live on the same floor as she did. So it was easier to avoid him. Millie quietly opened her door and peeked into the corridor. The coast was clear. For now. 
She stepped outside, locked her front door, and made her way to the staircase. There was less chance of running into someone on the stairs. Just a minute later, Millie was walking to the park. The summer sun was still shining brightly at 5 p.m. And she allowed herself to relax. She had been a bundle of nerves these last few days. But now, out here on a warm evening, Millie enjoyed knowing she was doing well. She had momentum. Those moments of blissful confidence usually only lasted for a minute or two, though. Then she reminded herself of all the hard work she had put into her career as a classical singer. She listed all the sacrifices her parents made every day. Millie also thought of how slim the odds were she would ever make enough money to move to a bigger apartment in New York City, even if she did have a career as a professional singer. These thoughts sure kept her feet on the ground. She had potential, but there was still a long road between potential and success. Millie knew she was in for a life of hard work, and lots of discipline. The glitz and glamour were only for the lucky few. Then again, every singer hoped for glitz and glamour in the end. It took a special kind of ego to want to be in that spotlight, she had heard an old teacher once say. And Millie had to admit he had been right. She liked to think of herself as a pretty modest person, especially when compared to other singers. But she knew she was as ambitious and could be as vicious as the next wannabe diva. Millie reached the entrance of the park a few minutes later. She pushed her sporting earbuds firmly behind her ears, took in a deep breath, and started running. Maybe I should put in some extra effort and make it a 90-minute run today, she thought. Never settle, Millie mumbled. Never, ever settle. Millie turned around to fluff her pillow. She was sitting upright in bed, paper scores and pages with notes scattered around her. The muscles in her neck were sore from peering down for hours. Millie leaned back and ran a hand through her brown hair. She had studied enough for one night and would continue tomorrow morning, she decided. Millie started gathering her papers to get them off the bed, happy with her progress. Now, she just wanted to get a good night of sleep. She had already changed into an old t-shirt an hour ago. In just under a week, she would attend her first master class at the Lincoln Center, the home of the Metropolitan Opera. She needed to be rested and well-prepared. Just thinking about her upcoming schedule made her restless and nervous, though. The next weeks, she would be attending countless coaching sessions to improve all aspects of her singing. Every single one of these sessions was worth more than a winning lottery ticket to Millie. It was the best possible training she could get 
from some of the most talented and experienced people in the world. She was about to get everything she had ever wished for. The coming two years, Millie would be able to learn from the best. It was the only way to become one of the best herself. Only a few singers and musicians ever got this chance. It was a prestigious position at one of the most renowned opera houses in the world, the Metropolitan Opera Company. The day she found out she had been accepted into the Met's Young Artist Development Program had been the happiest day of her life. She had walked on air for weeks. These last months, though, the stress of finding an apartment and making her budget work had taken much of her energy. For a while, Millie had thought she might not be able to make ends meet. Sure, she would receive a stipend for living expenses, but New York City was an expensive place to live. Her parents had had to cough up a considerable amount to help their daughter move from the Juilliard's dormitory to a tiny apartment in Harlem. The rent for her place was ludicrous. Life as a professional opera singer also wasn't cheap. There were the bills everyone has. Utilities, insurances, health care. But there were also other surprising costs, like having to buy a lot of expensive evening gowns. Millie had to think twice before spending every single dollar. But again, she never complained. Millie knew she had had more than her share of luck in this world. And not just because of her supportive parents. No, apart from being allowed into the Met's Young Artist Program, Millie had also been selected as the beneficiary of a grant by the Emsworth Leroy Foundation. The grant covered all costs for the program at the Met. But what made this grant really special was the extra involvement of the Emsworth Leroy family. They were famous for being personally involved in the careers of the artists they supported, while most other patrons just, well, wrote a check. She hadn't met anyone from the family yet, but She had heard wonderful stories about the old Mrs. Leroy. Meeting this rich and influential woman was a daunting prospect for Millie, a middle-class girl from a small town in Maryland. Millie knew she would have to get used to it. It was all part of the game. Many of the operas Millie studied and hoped to perform on the Met's stage one day, had been specifically created for, and paid for by, all sorts of nobility in the centuries past. It was only fitting that, in the United States, families who'd made a fortune of doing business were the contemporary royalty that supported the arts. Mrs. Leroy, for example, was famous for her successful chain of stores with ridiculously expensive chocolates. It had been her late husband, Henry Emsworth, a successful Wall Street banker, who had started the foundation, though. It was founded by him to support the future of his most passionate hobby, opera. After his sudden death, Mrs. Emsworth, Le Roy, had taken over. Millie had learned all of this from researching the Emsworth-Le Roy family 
when she had applied for the grant. When she received a surprise letter, the foundation had selected her as their beneficiary for the coming two seasons. Millie had been stunned. She hadn't even been invited for an audition. It truly had been the most bizarre thing. After contacting the foundation to ask if there might have been a mistake, she had been informed she really was accepted for the grant, and that most of the next steps would be handled by the staff at the Met. Millie didn't know what to expect after that. Her contact person at the Met had mentioned regular meetings with Mrs. Leroy, in addition to the other official events with the patrons, like the recital early in the season. Having a good relationship with the family would be a valuable asset, the man had also told her. Millie had asked him why and how exactly she had been selected for this grant, but he didn't know. I just do the follow-up, he had said. Really, it was all so strange. Millie hoped she would soon get a chance to ask the Emsworth family why she had been chosen. She wondered when exactly she would meet the mysterious Mrs. Emsworth Leroy for the first time. Oh, she said, her eyes widening. Millie hadn't checked her email for a couple of days. She had been so focused on unpacking and studying, she had forgotten about her email inbox. What if the foundation had tried to contact her? She got out of bed in a hurry, walked back into her small living room, and sat down on the couch. Her old laptop was resting on the coffee table. She opened it up, pushed the power button, and waited for the login screen to show. Millie smiled at her wallpaper that popped up after 15 long seconds. It was a picture of her performing at her graduation recital. She had worn a long, dark blue evening gown. Her hair had been elegantly pulled back in a low bun. The makeup artist had spoiled her with some extra glitter for her special night. Millie looked down at her bare legs and smirked. What a difference with how she looked right now. She pulled up her old t-shirt and sniffed it. Her mother's favorite washing detergent still lingered in the fabric. The t-shirt smelled like home. Millie entered her password and opened her email client. The sudden, bright, bluish light of the screen hurt her eyes. She blinked a couple of times while she waited for any new emails to arrive. Millie held her breath while she scanned the list of new messages in her inbox. There were some emails from friends, some newsletters, and then one sender whose name she didn't recognize. Millie clicked on the email sent by one Charlotte Williams. The sender addressed her as Miss North, and a quick glance at the email address told Millie this was the message she had been waiting for. Charlotte Williams was Mrs. Leroy's personal assistant, and she had been asked to set up a time for an introduction dinner, the email said. Millie gaped at the screen. Dinner? Oh my God. She had imagined meeting her patron at an opera house reception. Or a rehearsal studio. 
or maybe some fancy hotel bar serving high tea. Anything but a restaurant. It all seemed a little overwhelming for a first meeting. Millie sat back and sighed. She imagined sitting in a fancy restaurant somewhere in the Lincoln area with the elderly Mrs. Leroy. Her palms went sweaty just thinking about it. What would they talk about? What kind of questions would she have to answer? Was Millie eloquent enough to impress her benefactor? What if she got something stuck between her teeth and looked ridiculous? I won't order anything green or leafy, she decided then and there. Millie giggled. <laughs> This is stupid, she realized. They're already paying for my training. It's not an audition or an exam, right? Maybe it's even worse, Millie suddenly thought. This would be the first time she would sit down with a stranger who literally paid for her education. Not some school's judges or staff members, but someone who actually paid out of her own pocket. What if this Mrs. Leroy would in some way feel like she owned Millie? Like some sort of cultural pet? Would Millie be asked to perform at private parties? Birthdays, she suddenly wondered. Millie hid her face in her hands. These thoughts weren't helping her. She had to refocus. Years of intensive training had taught her to let go of things that didn't support her goals. She would just have to get used to this and put aside these feelings as well. When Millie sat back up to reply to the email, she noticed something in the text she hadn't paid attention to before. Charlotte had clearly stated she was the assistant to Mrs. Leroy. But she later referred to the patron as Miss Emsworth Leroy. Can you please let me know which of the following dates are suitable for your dinner with Miss Emsworth Leroy? The message said. A typo? Millie wondered. Probably. Or autocorrect. Even personal assistants made mistakes, right? Millie scanned the list of dates. Checked her calendar and was pleasantly surprised to see none of the dates overlapped with recitals or other events organized by the Met. This assistant was good at her job. Millie wrote a polite email thanking Mrs. Leroy for the invitation and listed the dates she was available. She quickly sent it off before she started worrying about how her email could be improved. She was a perfectionist in everything. Then Millie got up, stretched lazily, and yawned. A glance at the clock told her she desperately needed to go to bed if she wanted to have an eight-hour night of sleep. She slammed the laptop shut and took the few steps to her bedroom. Millie doubted she would actually fall asleep anytime soon, but she would give it a try. She always gave it at least a try.
This was part... <clears throat> wow, it's early. That was charming. Okay, again. This was part two of the diva story. And if you... Okay. You guys love girls. Sorry. Mostly girls. Some guys. You people. Oops. No, that sounds so wrong. Wow. This is going horrible. This was part two of the Diva Story. And if you'd like to get your hands on part three of the Diva Story, go sign up for the newsletter. I usually release the next episode a couple of days early to newsletter subscribers. So go check that out at lesbianromantic.com slash newsletter. Okay, I've got this new software. And apart from making my bloopers a bit more funny, oh, no. I also have some new cool stuff. Like I can play with spaces. Woohoo! Hello? Apparently, we're in a stone hall. And now it's a scary stone hall. Boo! Really, I can play with all sorts of effects and add a lot of things, like a choir. Hey, guys! Time to get started. And one, two. Okay, okay, time to drag myself away from all these special effects. I have been working on adding a lot more details and atmosphere to the episodes. I hope you noticed. This is something that uh, I'm really excited about. Thank you so much for your excited messages about the first part of the Diva story. Those messages really helped me to, you know, get a lot of energy and keep working on the next episode. So thank you. And I will see you next week. Bye. Right. How do I get out of here and back to my home office?